Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing absolutely fabulous. And of course, we are on part two of our story today. So I hope you're going to tune in and listen to it. If you haven't heard part one, then definitely go back to it because it's an amazing story and you don't want to miss out on it. So before we continue with our story, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with part two of our story. I was most aggrieved and affronted that Selby had such a dim, shallow view of me, and no comprehension of the genuinely close relationship I had had with Cynthia over the last couple of years. She looked on my relationship with Cynthia as superficial, insincere, frivolous and glib, when the reverse was actually true. I suppose you could say that Selby was not exactly perceptive. Granted I'd never even remotely warmed to her, Neither had Cynthia, for that matter. It seemed audaciously presumptuous of her that she believed Cynthia should have left her everything in her will. I'd never even considered that I'd get a penny from Cynthia, and I didn't want one either. But I was not going to throw away the incredible gift Cynthia had so graciously bestowed upon me. I knew I was very blessed, remarkably privileged, and most fortunate to be the recipient of her sizable inheritance. In the beginning, I had almost been hesitantly reluctant to become her friend, knowing too well that the woeful, fortuitous day would ultimately arrive when I'd have to say goodbye to her, and that was something I'd seriously dreaded. I was glad that Cynthia had been able to live out her days in her favourite home, so that in itself was a remarkable blessing. I knew a younger friend would not have exposed me to such a lamentable scenario, as she would more than likely still be in life. I couldn't help the fact that I was drawn to Cynthia, like iron filings to a magnet, and despite the fact that our friendship was far too short, it had made an indelible impression on my life, and I knew I would never ever forget her. I was twenty-five years old, but I was wearing the maturity of one much older than myself. As Cynthia's wisdom had rubbed off on me exponentially, it had powerfully influenced and persuaded my outlook on life. In such a positive, imperishable, enduring way, I no longer felt the unabating need to keep up with the Joneses by splashing my social media pages with pictures of me sipping champagne in places like Paris or going on a fancy yacht trip on the Mediterranean. Not that I would have done either of those glamorous things anyway, but I might have posted a polished, sophisticated page of myself looking rather dapper, as if surrounded by glitzy glamour in order to validate my sense of self-importance, as if to say to all my friends, Hey there! Look at me! I'm really someone quite significant, you know. All that frivolous stuff was illogically meaningless to me now, but there was a time I would have lapped it all up, rather like a cat with a saucer of milk. But no, not any more. So much had changed, I had changed, and I was beginning to like the new me. I had become increasingly more confident and self-assured. Cynthia had helped me to see through the freckless transparency of it all. I would regularly visit her gravesite to talk to her, lay down fresh flowers. It was a point of contact for me that made me feel incredibly close to my beloved friend. I had learnt from the solicitor that Selby had persuaded her to leave everything to her. But when I came into Cynthia's life, she had changed her will, unbeknown to me describing me to her solicitor as the grandchild she never had. I'm so pleased, she told him. I was going to leave my house to a perfect stranger that I don't particularly even like, who's a complete oddball to me. Now I'm leaving my home to my very best friend, and I couldn't be happier about that. I had offloaded a lot of stuff of Cynthia's like clothes and other knick-knacks that I didn't want, and given them to a charity shop. I also succeeded in making my sumptuous living space all my own, with painted interiors, new kitchen fittings and more modern granite countertops, and some comfortable, fashionable classic furnishings. One thing that remained forever unchanged was the spectacular views from the floor-to-ceiling glass windows that overlooked the panoramic views of the spectacular coast, where the shimmering blue ocean under the morning sun would twinkle brightly through the windows of my home, welcoming in a brand new day. I considered myself enormously lucky to be the proud owner of this classic style property with its Italianite influences and excellent ornate architecture. 
The imposing white house was comfortably nestled on solid foundations of a rather stout rocky outcrop that rose up on a high elevation and was thickly iced by a smooth, levelled-out plateau of lush, viridescent evergreen lawn, like what you'd expect to find on a golfing green. The yard was liberally scattered with the tall, masterful lineations of the dogwoods, the cottonwoods, the oak and willow trees that protected it from the obstreperous north winds. Those blustering, uncongenial, punnelling windstorms could sometimes get quite frisky, wreaking havoc on the plants or anything not tethered to the ground by superglue. But the trees provided a fabulous windbreak. There were beds filled with azaleas, lilies, Mexican sage, shrubs, heathers, lavenders, pansies, and ornamental cabbages. So the yard looked spectacular all year round. And a gardening service took care of the maintenance twice a week, which made my life all the more easy. I would return home every day from my job in town, where I worked for a local solicitors, managing the affairs in the office dealing with clients on the phone and so forth. I would come home in the late afternoon and walk happily down the metal staircase from my lawn that weaved its way down the rocky incline to the ribbon of yellow beach below. I thoroughly enjoyed taking an exhilarating leisurely stroll down the golden beach with the wind blowing against my hair. I loved watching the ocean waves crashing against the jutting rocks, feathering them with a white foamy discharge. I could hear the cries of seagulls soaring above my head and see the distant shapes of boats framing the horizon under the shadowy glaze of the late afternoon sun. I could taste the salt on my tongue, drink in the vibrant fresh air. It was always so beautiful, and the best feeling of all was the feeling of my toes rubbing against the sand and the rolling water drenching them with ice-cold nudges. One day after enjoying a brief leisurely stroll on the beach, I returned home. Something felt different about my place. Almost as if in my brief absence, someone had been here, as the tranquility seemed disrupted and oddly different. The energy was significantly darker, as if the light atmosphere had been vanquished. Nothing was actually out of place, but I had the sense that my environment had definitely been disturbed. I did find a single flower from my flower arrangement on the hall table, lying in the middle of the floor. How did it get from the vase on the table to the middle of the floor like this? It hadn't been like that before. That was one little incongruous thing that left me feeling on edge. My thoughts turned to Selby and her two formidable Haitian friends. I wondered if they'd been in my house. The thought gave me the creeps as I reflected how Ricardo had looked at me through his dark eyes that had become as white as snow, and I clandestinely wondered if the intimidating man was actually possessed. I was sure they were deeply entrenched in voodoo. That night as I prepared myself some pasta, I sat down to watch some television and finally retreated to my bedroom, and I could not shake off the disturbing feeling that I was being watched. It was like in the corner of my eyes I would always see a strange light, but I'd turn around only to see nothing there at all. I told myself, meeting Selby, her unkind accusations she had unleashed upon me so gracelessly, and the presence of her peculiar unorthodox Haitian friends, had somehow played a teasing suggestive game with my imagination. These creeping feelings had seized my engagement so ruthlessly were only an unfortunate consequence of that meeting with the objectionable woman. I was reading too much into it, seeing things that weren't really there, that were creatively feeding my imagination, like a frenzied school of piranhas, and I was biting the bait. Yet despite everything, this unsettling feeling that someone had interfered in my space while I was away, and the odd anomaly of the lone flower lying in the middle of the passage, left me feeling unhinged. I chastised myself for being so impressionable and returned to bed with a heavy heart. The fatigue of a long drawn out day with the demands of a hectic schedule at the office had worn me to a frazzle. So I gratefully sank into my bed, pulling the sheets over me and drifted off into a deep sleep, only to be awoken with my bed being shaken very wildly. I opened my eyes in a panic my whole body trembles under the vibration of my bed. 
I look up to discover that my sliding doors from the bedroom that lead out onto the private patio are wide open and an icy cold wind is blowing through the room. My bed is shaking violently, but then it suddenly stops. I climb out of my bed to close the sliding doors behind me, knowing full well that I secured them before I went to bed. I begin to doubt myself, which I know is part of human nature. I think maybe I didn't secure them after all, but that didn't explain why my whole bed had been violently shaking like that. But the following morning when I woke up, I began to wonder if the shaking bed and the open patio door had been all but a dream. Of course it was a dream, I told myself, my mind desperately looking for a reasonable explanation to make sense of these idiosyncrasies. Over the next few weeks, strange, rather curious things begin to happen in my home. But it's all very subtle. I couldn't explain or rationalise these things, but believe me, I tried. One is always looking for sound reasoning, to explain life's little oddities, like keys that should be found hanging on the hook, now found lying in the bathtub, or a slipper found in the oven, or even fresh food now in the freezer when it should have been in the refrigerator, and I was certain I'd put it there. I kept telling myself I was overtired from the demands of my job, becoming increasingly absent-minded. One thing that happened day after day was a single lone flower from the vase on the hall table would always be found lying on the floor in the entrance hall when I returned home. When I told my friend at work about it, she said, "'It's probably your friend from the other side getting your attention, leaving you a sign that she's still around, playing games with you. She's watching over you, that's all.' "'You think so?' I said. "'Absolutely,' said my friend, with a passionate conviction." I mean, Cynthia was a grandmother figure in your life, was she not? When people die, they often try to reach out to us, let us know they're around. After my dad passed away, a balloon floated into my bedroom. My dad loved balloons. Stuff like that doesn't randomly just happen. It's a sign. It's a sign that you're hearing from your friend. I wanted desperately to believe my friend was right, and that Cynthia was reaching out to me from beyond the grave to let me know she was still around. But then, if that really were the case, why did the energy in my house feel increasingly heavy, and there was a darkness I'd never felt before? Cynthia had a light, cheerful energy, an ebullience to her personality. But my house was not feeling her lightness. No, it was feeling heavy. Let's just say strange anomalies continued to appear in my home. They were so ambiguously elusive and indistinct that I was forever reassuring myself that my imagination was just in overdrive. Yet I continued to see an odd light in my peripheral vision that always seemed to dodge my attention when I turned around directly to look at it. Things were forever being misplaced in my home, and then replaced in the most outlandish, inscrutable places where I'd never have put them. One day I returned, and was unable to get into my front door. I turned the key in the lock, but it refused to respond as if something was on the other side, barricading it, barring me from actually entering my own home. I tried a couple more times, and then the door opened, but it was peculiarly odd. Then one week things took a turn for the worst, as if the weather had changed from overcast to stormy in my home. It first happened one night when I was sitting in front of the television set, watching a comedy. I was gravitating towards watching comedies more than ever before as they seemed to lift the heavy ambience of my home, that of late had become all-consuming to me. I kept these private, dispiriting thoughts to myself, lest people should think I was going crazy. One day as I was watching television, this black mass started to develop in the corner of my living room, like a thick, dense, cloying mist, but whatever it was, it was so incredibly evil. I knew it was watching me. Then it just vanished from my sight. I think it was now making its presence known to me, which at least made me poignantly aware that something was definitely going on in my home, and I wasn't going mad after all. My feathers were ruffled, my nerves were on edge, every single part of me was trembling. I quickly grabbed my keys and a torch and dashed across my lawn, down the meandering metal steps towards the beach. I was out of breath, not from being unfit, but from being scared out of my wits. I'd never taken a walk on the beach at night before, 
but the beach was a place I could find some soulful perspective, where I could steady my tumultuous thoughts and gain a sense of peace. I always found the crashing sound of the waves thrusting themselves obstreperously against the rocks incredibly comforting, very reassuring. I needed to surround myself with their tranquillity that they offered me so generously, now more than ever. It was such a blissfully beautiful night. It was hard to believe something so offensively ugly could have interfered so rudely in the living room of my home, given the sparkling beauty of such a beguiling evening. For a moment the prepossessing tranquillity of my beach walk cleared away the cluttered chaos of my tenebrous thoughts, and for a short while my mind was actually calmed. The stars in the velvety canopy were as bright as diamonds, while a full moon gleamed through the night like a lighthouse, casting her ethereal shadows over the water. I could see the stars and the moon were elegantly reflected over the twinkling surface of the water, while it steadily rolled forwards towards the shoreline in billowing waves that caressed the beach in a trail of lacy, bubbling froth. I took off my sandals, carrying them in my hand, allowing the golden sand to rub against my feet as I walked up and down the beach while enjoying a cool breeze kissing my cheeks. The weather was pleasantly warm. Finally I sat down on the soft mounds of beach sand and stared out at the glittering water of the ocean. It was then that I see this ambiguous, tenebrous form moving down the beach towards me. My first thought is, what the hell is that? Let's just say after encountering the spine-chilling black mass in my living room, I wondered in horror if it had surreptitiously followed me down to the beach. The thing moving towards me was dense, solid, thick, heavy and black. I sat there, my eyes transfixed. I didn't move, nor did I run away. I just stared and stared, trying to focus on what I was actually seeing, as I could make no sense of it at all. I think my fear was hijacked by an inquisitive curiosity, as what was moving towards me was most certainly not the black mass I'd witnessed in the living room. Granted, it was black, every bit as intimidating, obscure, and definitely big. But the energy was different. It was light, airy, benevolent. To my amazement, the figure is waving at me and trying to get my attention, and then it's only standing a few feet away from me. I shine my torch on this curious anomaly, and the creature waves its hand, as if to say, Please don't do that. I knew it found the bright light of my torch disturbing and obtrusive. I think the creature had night vision. He had the yellow eye shine you often see in bears. To my amazement, the creature sinks into the sea sand, not too far from me, and in the light of the full moon, casting its revelatory shadows over the creature, I know at once what it is. I'm astounded. Indeed, there are no words to describe the level of confoundment I actually feel. I'm sitting two feet away from the Bigfoot. I can hear the rise and fall of his chest. I can smell the saltiness in his long, flowing dark hair, and most of all observe the humanness of his face. I think it was this creature's noble face that bewildered me the most. I realised this Bigfoot was so much more human than I would have ever deemed possible. I was always under the distinct impression that a Bigfoot would have powerful primate influences, but this creature, beyond his cone-shaped head and the Herculean robust proportions of his body, along with his dark swaying hair that swathed his sizable contours, he was exceedingly human in every single regard. Yet beyond that there was a conspicuous intelligence to him, beyond that of the human kind, almost as if this creature had a great spiritual awareness and understanding. The creature is looking directly at me, with an earnestness that demands my attention. He's pointing to my white house on top of the rocky outcrop, that from this position on the beach looks like a little matchbox perched on top of a huge rock. Dark energy. Dark, dark, evil energy, he says. He points directly at me. You are in grave, grave danger. He then hands me a rock. I hold it in my hands. It looks pretty ordinary to me. Keep the rock. It'll keep you safe. Thank you, I say. The creature nods. He turns around, pointing directly at my house on the rock. Get help. You need it. 
I watch him gliding away. I'm now thinking I must be going stark raving mad. That Bigfoot actually spoke to me in my mind. I glance down at the unassuming, very ordinary little rock in my hand. It feels unusually warm to the touch, and makes me feel calm. Rocks are normally cold to the touch, unless they've been heated by a very hot sun. This rock feels as if it's been heated. But the evening is warm, not hot. So why is this rock uncharacteristically hot? Did that really happen? Did a Bigfoot really tell me that there's evil in my home, and I need to get help? What were the chances that a creature from the pages of Pulp Fiction that I didn't even believe existed until now had made its appearance known to me, had reached out to me, to warn me about the danger I was in? I knew in my gut that by nature these creatures were reticently evasive and enjoyed keeping themselves to themselves. But this unorthodox creature, sensing the trouble I was in, had clearly stepped out of his comfort zone to give me some sagacious advice. I unequivocally believed he was right and decided that in the morning I would do just that, call for help. Little did I know that the night that lay ahead of me would offer me an unsavoury platter that would not be easy to digest, and I was about to have a night of horror that I would not wish on a living soul. I clutch the river stone in my hands, eagerly returning home, and I drink a warm hot chocolate made with whole milk. Then I settle down for the night, wisely putting the river stone on my nightstand, so it's easily accessible to me. The warm milk helps me to quickly drift off to sleep. I am awoken to the sound of whispering all over my bedroom. I sit up with a start. I get the profound sense that I'm not alone, but that my room is filled with an audience of spectators, and that my bed is the stage, that I am the entertainment. The whispering I hear sounds like a plethora of people talking negatively about me, and whatever they have to say about me, it's not nice at all, like a bunch of bullies on the school playground conspiring against you. It felt very personal. Then I see it rising from the corner of my bedroom, the same black, thick, dense cloud of smoke I'd seen earlier in the evening, but this time it's thicker, blacker and bigger than ever before. It releases a dreadful stench all over my bedroom that smells of death and decay. I feel as if I'm about to throw up. I want to scream, cry out. Every part of my body recoils in terror. This thing starts to take on a human-like form, but one that is so gruesome, so distorted, so hideously ugly. There are no words to describe it to you, but I will tell you this. This thing was drenched up from the bowels of the earth, regurgitated from the realms of hell itself. It bounds onto my bed. Its heaving, robust, heavy form plunders my bed covers with a forceful thrust. And then he's on top of me. His face is steaming above me as all the smoke rises out of him. And his incandescent eyes are like burning hot coals of red fire. His nostrils are flaring. I can hear the haunting whispers in the bedroom, becoming inflamed with excitability, as if the audience of spectators watching me is thrilled by what they are seeing. I can hear their vindictive chuckles. I have never seen such a treacherous hatred as I saw in the eyes blazing above me. I knew this thing wanted to kill me, but worse than kill me, he wanted to steal my soul. He is grinning at me with yellow mangled teeth caked in blood, a malevolent grin. He's rejoicing in my fear, as if my terror is absolutely delicious. He then begins to throttle my neck with his hands and I try desperately to fight back, but I can't. He's shaking me so violently. I know I'm going to die. My life flashes before me. I can barely breathe as the stranglehold of his grip around my neck gets tighter and tighter and tighter. I instinctively reach out to my nightstand and grab the river stone, thrashing it at this creature. I see fear in his eyes when he sees the river stone. The stone seems to become a bright yellow colour. He shrinks back, and this time his face reflects terror. As he retreats, his red furious eyes fixed on the river stone. There is a whirling sound, and then all these vertical ridges of black smoke rise up out of the floor, and then they vanish before my very eyes. I look down at the river stone in my hand. It's now gone back to its original colour. It's very hot. Whatever the Bigfoot had given me, it scared the hideous demonical entity away. 
but I couldn't get to sleep for the rest of the night, and left my house to sleep in the truck, where I kept my Riverstone safely by my side. Clarissa's account. I received a phone call from a very distressed woman called Skye, claiming I needed to come at once, as there was a demonical entity in her home. I am an intuitive with psychic abilities, and the moment I received her call, I sensed that the woman I was speaking to was in perilously grave danger, so I immediately phoned up Father Terence Penrose to inform him that he needed to drop everything at once to help this woman, who was in grievous trouble. We needed plenty of holy water, lots and lots of it. "'What do you think is going on with her?' asks Father Penrose. "'I don't know, Father, but the moment she phoned me I got this awful, baleful sense of foreboding. There's something demonical in her house, hell-bent on killing her. But this thing, whatever it is, it wants more than her. It wants her soul. That's what it's after. I'll be right over. I'm on my way. When me and Father Penrose arrived at Skye's house, the woman was in a dreadful state. She was an attractive woman in her twenties with long dark hair that bounced on her shoulders and green eyes that looked saturated with terror. I have seen that look on many haunted clans before, and I could sense the relief my presence actually brought her. I noticed she was holding a river stone in her hand. Her knuckles were white. Whatever this thing was that she was holding, it seemed to give off a powerful white energy. I knew I would question her about it later. There was something very special about that river stone. It isn't normal for me to see energy from an inanimate object like a stone. I'm so glad you've come, she told me. I don't think I could sleep in this house another night if you hadn't come along. Something evil is going on in my house, and last night it tried to kill me. At first it was this thick black mass that morphed into this hideous being. It climbed on my bed and began to strangle me. This thing had glowing eyes. They were red, and the ugliest face I've ever seen. It was filled with such hatred for me. It wanted me dead. I could feel other entities in the room. They'd come to watch. They were actually laughing and jeering at me. It was like they were entertained by my fear, getting almost inebriated on it. I didn't like what Skye was telling me, but even before I entered her house, I could feel the dark, bodeful energy. I'm just going to walk around your house, I say. I need to get a sense of things. I noticed that most of the dark energy was coming from one of the bedrooms in the house that looked to me to be just an insignificant spare room for a guest. But this room was otherwise occupied by this evil presence that did not want me there. It was screaming at me, Get out of my way! I have a job to do! I'm the soul collector! We've come to get her soul! Get out of my way! I have a right to be here! I was called! You cannot send me away! Not until I've got the soul I've come to collect! I move around the room, and I bend my head under the bed where I'm sensing is the source of the very dark energy. Then I see it, an arrangement of voodoo regalia. I immediately leave the arrangement, but instinctively pull out a voodoo doll that has been plundered with all kinds of pins very viciously. I knew what this doll was. The doll represented Sky. Someone wanted to kill her, and were using black magic to attain their goal. They had called up this evil entity. I phoned up a Haitian friend of mine, I've got a problem, I tell him, giving him Skye's address. Drop everything you're doing right now. I need your help. Right, I'll be with you in a sec. I return to Skye's kitchen, carrying the voodoo doll in my hand. Father Terence is talking with Skye intently, trying to reassure the discomposed woman, who is pumped up with adrenaline and is decidedly on edge. It wants to kill me, she keeps repeating over and over again. It wants to kill me. It wants to kill me. The tears spill down her cheeks. "'What did you pick up?' asks Father Penrose, looking at me with concern. "'I perceive a very dark energy. It's been harassing me since I entered the house. But thankfully I fasted yesterday, so I'm feeling on jolly good form.' Skye's eyes drop down on the voodoo doll that I'm holding in my hands. "'What's that?' she asks, looking perturbed. "'I found this voodoo doll in one of the spare rooms in your house.' Which one? asks Sky. The room with the rather attractive blue bed covers. Sky throws a shocked hand over her face. That was where Selby slept, when she lived here, before Cynthia died. Do you think this woman had reason to want to harm you? I ask. Well, she did say nasty things to me, 
She was very unhappy Cynthia left her house to me, and not to her. Could she have hated you enough to want to kill you? Oh, I'm not sure. She's really weird. She hangs around with these Haitian men that I didn't like at all. One of them looked possessed. One time he looked at me, and his eyes went white. They were terrifying. Tell me, do you think Selby was engaged in voodoo at all? Oh, yes. She even gave Cynthia a criss-criss once. You know, a lucky amulet, I'm told. She removed it when she came to the house, when she complained about my acquiring Cynthia's inheritance. She was furious about that. She did threaten me. This is a voodoo doll that I'm holding. These pins have been strategically placed in all the chakras. This girl Selby has conjured up a demon to kill you. She wants you dead. The voodoo doll is representative of you. That demon I saw last night definitely wanted me dead, says Skye, looking at me in horror. That's right, he did. Is there any way we can get rid of it? Yes, of course we can. I've called over a Haitian friend of mine who knows how to reverse voodoo spells. I've worked with him before. He should be here in any moment. My Haitian friend arrived within minutes. I'm glad to say he has helped me on so many occasions with this daunting world of black magic that can conjure up all kinds of things beyond one's understanding using the power of voodoo spells. He slipped into Selby's old bedroom, took the voodoo doll from me, and surreptitiously performed his magic. He then came out of the room, nodded at me, and told me it was done, and then he was gone. Now it was our job to bless the house and command the demonic entity to leave. Back to Sky. What can I say? I was heartily relieved to finally have Clarissa in my house. She was a young woman, older than me, possibly in her thirties. She had an audaciously determined look in her eyes that gave me the confidence to know that she was hell-bent on getting rid of this demonic entity that she believed wanted me dead. She arrived at my house with a man of the cloth. I was surprised she didn't even doubt that I had an evil entity in my home. From one phone call, she had sensed I was in trouble and had dropped everything on my account. I noticed the father did not like the energy in my home at all. He described it as clawing around him, trying to push him out of the house, as if it didn't want him there. I liked the father. He was also resolutely determined. He was not going to be intimidated by anything dark. He was to tell me after the event he'd felt something punching him in the back. I observed him grimacing and bending over, but I had no idea that the poor man was being physically attacked by the evil entity. When Clarissa came into the kitchen, she was carrying a strange voodoo doll in her hands that was punctured with needles in strategic points that she claimed were body meridians. I noticed she was wearing a somber, subdued expression on her face that told me categorically that whatever was in my home was exceedingly dark and dangerous, and definitely not a ghost, but a demonical entity. When she informed me that the voodoo spell had been cast on me, I knew Selby and her Haitian friends were behind all of this, but I was gobsmacked that they actually wanted me dead. I couldn't believe there were people on this earth, filled with such a vengeful hatred, they wanted to do something like this to another human being. But then you learn something new every day. Perhaps I was just terribly naive. I do remember the first time I met Selby, and she watched me and Cynthia talking in the living room. There was something so dark about her. I believe she's been dabbling not only with the Haitian culture, but also with the dark side of voodoo. This was absolutely confirmed when Clarissa called a Haitian friend around, who arrived on the scene to dismantle the voodoo spell. It was fortunate that this one could actually be undone. There are some that are actually fixed. I noticed Clarissa's Haitian friend had brown eyes filled with light. There was a warmth about him. I really liked him. He was very different to Selby's friends, who were so dark by contrast. Clarissa led the Haitian gentleman into Selby's bedroom. We could hear him chanting in the Creole language for a long time. He left my house with a big smile, reassuring me that all was well now. I could tell whatever he had done had drained him of his energy. He looked considerably fatigued. I felt relieved, and the energy in the house was significantly lighter. Clarissa told me I needed to be strong and stand on my faith. She asked me about the stone I was carrying, and I placed it in her hand. Where did you get this from? she asked, looking perturbed. This stone is filled with a light energy. It's very warm. I told her my incredulous story about the Bigfoot on the beach that I'd met. Wow! 
I'm not kidding, but this stone definitely protected you last night. It's light energy. It repelled the evil in your home. The Bigfoot must be some kind of a light worker. He reached out to help you. He obviously saw the dark energy from your home. There are angels among us, you know, and the Bigfoot you met is clearly one of them. Clarissa walked around my home patiently with the father at her side. We prayed the prayers of St. Benedict and the Archangel Michael. Until this point, everything had remained very calm. But when we entered Selby's room, it was chaotically claustrophobic, very oppressive, thick with a dark, intimidating energy. I could feel the presence of the demon that I'd encountered the previous night. When we prayed in the room, it was filled with a powerful windstorm. The demon was growling at us. The wind seemed to punnel against our clothes, but we stood firm in our faith, and the black mass began to appear before us. Finally it evaporated and vanished, and my whole house was filled with a sparkling light. I'm glad to tell you that I remain in my beachfront home, with no dark energy any more. My life returned to normal. My home is filled with a loving energy, and things no longer go missing. But even all these years later, I still have a distinct dislike for Selby's room, because I always think of her, and it brings me unpleasant memories of the objectionable woman. I regret to say I haven't seen the Bigfoot again, although I sometimes walk on the beach, hoping for an encounter. But I keep the unassuming Riverstone by my bed at night. I'm glad to say I have never needed it. I often think of my beloved friend Cynthia, and could swear I sometimes sense her presence in my home. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.